Hey, welcome to episode 119 of the Brigaders League of Beer and Comics. The Beer and Comics. Hey, guys. Hey, I'm Jeff. This is uh, Andrew. I'm Andrew. Um, and we are, uh, I'm for, you know, Colin and David, for, for various reasons, aren't able to join us this evening. So we wish them the best. We hope that they're okay and all that jazz. But um, this, yeah, how are you, Andrew? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm pretty good. It's been, a, it's, been a, it's, been, it's been not long at all since the last time I spoke to you is last Thursday. Um, I've actually not had a day off. I've done seven days on, but I'm, I'm starting holiday now, so I'm, I'm, I'm chilled. I've got a beer in my hand. Uh, I'm looking forward to a bit of a chat tonight and then just yeah, relaxing for a couple of weeks. That's amazing. So, um, what beer have you got? Um, we usually talk about this a wee bit later, but I'm still working through my Black Ale Brewery. Um, ones, so I've got a couple of Black Ale Brewery IPAs on the go tonight. They're, they're 21 Pale, which is a classic. Um, at the moment, I'm drinking the Spider Monkey, um, which is a organic, unfiltered IPA. And you know, I love an IPA. Yeah. That's it. That's, that's, that's quite. That's, that's quite amazing. Um, I. Uh, what was I going to say? Um, I. I'm going to talk about that a wee bit more later on. But um, I am drinking for a specific reason. My last can of speech bubble. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I believe I'm, st I'm still waiting for something to be delivered, but I'm sure yeah, I'll get I've, it. Got, I've, I've got um, some on ice for you, so to bring down. But, um, yeah, oh. the, the haberdashery where they store all the spare cans are has been closed for about a week. So I'm going mm -hmm. in on Saturday because, um, as Brugaders, we we were entitled to some cans. So um, yeah, so that's exciting. So I thought, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's, um, it's a good beer, and it's going to be a good night. Um, our Special cool. guest this evening is um, uh, I think we, we've talked about um, we've talked about like sort of when you discover f folk that you're really into um, from total random places. I don't know I don't know how you became aware of Andrew uh, Wellman's work, but I am um, I'm a father of of young children, and uh, I actually um, was first introduced to Andrew's work through um, being one of the co-creators of Sh uh, Shane the Chef. Which is a which is a marvelous uh, children's program on Channel Five <laughs> about a, about um, a, a chef and his daughter working in a cafe in a small coastal village in, in South England. So <laughs> I think it's in South England. Um, for, for for me, I mean, I'm I'm looking forward to speaking to him. Um, for for me, it was his work on uh, Ghostbusters. Um, I know Ghostbusters are big upon Transformers. Yeah. Um, I absolutely loved uh, those Transformers comics. Um, and I know you did this, uh, you know, I, I've, I've been reading them for a very long time. I've been reading them from like 1980s. Um, but, you know, so just, just and just his, his work on them was really reminiscent of the, the sort of very early stuff. I know he's, he's, he, he probably, he, he doesn't look as if he's old enough to have been working on them back in the 1980s. I'm assuming, I know, I know he started them sort of in the early 2000s or something like that. Um, but the art style was just absolutely perfect for what I remembered. Um, from back in the day, so um, I'm sure. I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure he'll appreciate. I'm sure, I'm sure, he'll he'll be be, I'm sure he'll appreciate that. He, he, he may be one of those guys that's actually seventy and just looks um, considerably <laughs> younger. Than I, 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 know, I know. Just, I know just because I'm. I'm, I'm, I'm that's a fan of his work. I've read up. Um, Andrew had. He did work on uh, several titles, including the Transformers in the eighties. So he is mm. old enough to do that, which is incredible. Because, like you say, like. Um, <laughs> I, 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 I met him a couple of minutes ago and thought ah, he, he wasn't working on it in the eighties. He's old enough to have done that. Um, in, in which case, yeah, phenomenal, phenomenal. Yeah. So we're going to bring Andrew on just in a moment. Um, yeah, fantastic uh, artist, uh, um, and um, has worked in various industries, including comics. For um, um, has been um, an artist on the real Ghostbusters and Transformers, and he's just to name a couple of things. Is his work on Transformers? Is I think regarded as among uh, as among some of the, the 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 best work and sort of synonymous with the um with Transformers history actually. Uh, also, he's worked on a GI Joe. He he's worked with Titan Publishing. He as I say, pre he um he's done work for television, including did storyboarding for things like Doctor Who and Luther, and um the Alienist. Uh, amongst many other things, also graphic novels, which we'll be talking about as well. He's got his own work out just now, which I'm, I can't wait to hear him about. So without further ado, uh, please welcome to the show, uh, Mr. Andrew Wildman. Hello, Hello Andrew Wildman. <laughs> what did I say there? 
Poor old Andrew Wildman. He's, yeah. he's, no, he's actually older yeah. than he looks. Yeah. <laughs> oh, much younger, man. Much, much younger. <laughs> How are you? You're right. I'm very well, thank you. Yes, very well. Yeah. You, you guys good? Yeah. I should turn this up just slightly. Uh, yeah, very good. Um, just been working hard and, 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 and you know, loving the life. <laughs> good. Okay, what have you been working on just now, Andrew? Have you like as I say, you're 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 massively prolific, and I'll I'll be sharing pictures of your work as we as we chat to you. But um, okay, what, what am I working on now? Um, I'm kind of juggling a few things. So today was an interesting day. So for the first time since August, I went into London. I've been avoiding London for obvious reasons. <laughs> <laughs> Probably best. Um, yeah. yeah. But I was asked to go into London today on a recce. So there's a TV show that was came out, oh, I don't know if it's last year, probably the year before, called The Capture. I don't know whether you saw that. Yeah, um, it was like a, a kind of crime show around the use of like fake footage and CCs. Oh, yeah, that's the one with the, um, so sorry, 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 if the one with the bus and it goes in yeah. front of the, yeah, yeah, yeah I did see, I, I thoughtly enjoyed that. I, uh, wrong problem was in it. Uh, that was a good show. Okay, right. So so I did all the storyboarding for season one. Oh, so helped, helped working out all those bus scenes and how, you know, they could get two versions of the same thing, all that kind of stuff. So I worked with um, Ben Channon, the director on that. He was also the writer as well. Um, and then I got a call from Ben because they're currently working on season two. Um, oh, and he's he's not, I think he's directing some of it, but not all of it. Um, but there was a particular scene that they need to shoot on Sunday and they couldn't quite get their heads around it. So they were having a recce today in London on a particular location. So they asked me to go into London and kind of walk around the location with them and be part of working, working out how it's all going to be shot. I mean, ultimately they work it out, but you know, what I do is kind of draw it up as a storyboard, just sometimes really rough, sometimes finished, but um, it just helps them visualize it so that they can then communicate how that's going to work to the rest of the crew. So, um, so yeah, that was the first mission into London so today. I was I today. Thought it's storyboarding as it's like comics for movies, isn't it? It's like you, yeah. when you do the storyboarding, it's, it's just doing the rough sketches of pages, but instead of pages, it's going to be minutes on screen or, or, or whatever. Um, yes, it is. It's, it's kind of a rough layout. I guess you do it to normally you do it to the standard of like in terms of comics, like rough layouts, really. So mm -hmm. not finished yeah. pencils and certainly not inked. Sometimes no. you get the opportunity, like I'm currently just coming to the end of working on a movie where because movies have longer production and usually a bigger mm -hmm. budget. So it allows time to do quite nice finished panels, you know, for mm -hmm. the books. But usually it's more about it's less about how pretty they are and it's more about just communicating the information that's needed. Um, yeah. So as well as drawing, it's like you have to annotate them and describe the action and um, you get and it depends how far you want to go as a storyboard artist. I mean, some storyboard artists um, just kind of do sketches that are a visual aid i like to go a step further than that just because i'm so interested in film anyway yeah. um, so i'm interested in different kinds of lenses and stuff like that you know when they have what kind of wide lens they're going to use or what kind of long lens they're going to use because that that changes the way that the final shot will look mm. so if you get that sort of information from the have those conversations with the director as well it helps you get do a drawing that's more accurate to how they're actually going to shoot it um and i do sometimes mock up 3d models as well so you can drop a lens mm -hmm. in and see how much parallax there is and how much depth and all those kind of things um because it's very easy to to do a board that kind of makes sense in terms of the way that the narrative is described but when they actually come to shoot it the lines of sight don't work, you know, the characters are not deep enough in the shot, all that kind of stuff. So, 
I suppose, do, do you, I mean, are you, are you working like from, from the script or are you working with the director? So you imagine normally you, you assume it's the director's vision. Um, yeah, I, I work with the director. So what they'll normally do is sometimes they'll send you the full script depending on how much information they're prepared to give away in the early stages of production. Sometimes they'll just send you the bits of the scenes that you're going to be working on. Um, and that's usually sent ahead of a meeting with a director. So then, I mean, obviously more recently we've had some Zoom kind of ch chats with directors, yeah. but but usually it's it's in person. It's a lot easier to do it in person because then, you know, while the director's talking, he can get up and move around and, you know what I mean? He can help describe it. Sort yeah. of. Um, so then <clears throat> go through the script and the way that I tend to work with directors is not just listen to what they're saying and just make notes and then do drawings. It's like discussing how the shots can be achieved because some directors, some directors play it very close to their chest or they know exactly what they want and they just want you to draw that. The, the directors that I've kind of worked with more often than not, um, like Jamie Payne, who I've worked with on Doctor Who and The Alienist and Luther and Farron Blackburn's another one, worked with him on Doctor Who and The Interceptor and a couple of other shows. There's a few of them that they they enjoy the conversation. They enjoy having somebody else there who, who they can bounce ideas off yeah. um, and also work out, because I also work with effects um, crews as well. So having a good a good knowledge of how visual effects or special effects can be achieved is really valuable because then as you go through the shot you can you can work out what's the best way to achieve the shot they want um and what, how much visual effects and how much special effects are going to be required because in tv it's it's budget i mean you yeah. massively have to you play yeah. underneath the ceiling of the budget. Movies sometimes that's a bit flexible, but in TV very rarely. So, when I say I'm speaking about some of the stuff you're talking about, there obviously Doctor Who always looks fantastic. Um, Luther's kind of more more withdrawn, but the, the, um, is it the, the Alienist that you talked you talked about? That that show for me always looked phenomenal. I mean, I'm, I'm a sucker for a for a period, a dark yeah. period drama anyway. And and the cast in that was just just phenomenal as well. So, you know that that, that was a phenomenal piece of work for me. Um, Daniel Daniel, oh, I don't remember his name. Um, uh, Brule was it? Daniel Brule it wasn't yeah. it? Was, it was the main sort of guy. That was a great show. And Luke yeah. And Luke. yeah. Dakota Fanning and uh, was it Luke Luke Evans? Is it? Uh, Luke Evans. Yeah. yeah. It was an amazing amazing cast. Mm. Um, I'd worked with Jamie a lot, and when he he was he was one of the directors because very often on a series you don't have sometimes you have one director that directs a whole series but that's that's quite rare on a big on a yeah. big show um, so a director will direct what they call a block so it's mm. usually like two episodes or more so mm. I think Jamie was the first block of the Alienist was directed by um, uh, Jakob Verbruggen, a Belgian director who I hadn't worked with before, but then I did a bit on The Alienist. But then I did all of Jamie's stuff. And that um, that whole New York, you know, uh, sort of turn of the century, by uh, Victorian New York street um, was all built on a back lot in um, Budapest. So it's <laughs> crazy. Eh? So, so they... Jamie said that he wanted he was having to work out there he was he was living out there while I was working on the show because he was the overseeing director as well so he yeah. worked with all the episodic directors um so he arranged to fly me out there <laughs> <laughs> he said he said get a taxi to the airport and then um we'll fly you out to to Budapest and then a car will meet you at the airport and take you to your accommodation. I'm like, what? You know, I don't usually get treated. <laughs> <in this world. laughs> um, so, so I got to the airport, got on the plane, flew flew to Budapest, um, and then I was met at the airport. This was taken out of the airport to a car, you know, like a seven seater thing, like they do 
you know, like, like they ferry people backwards and forwards to hotels, mm. you know, that kind of thing. So I go out in the car and the driver said, um, I've got to give you this envelope. So he gave me, he gave me an envelope and it had got some paperwork in it that I needed to sign to give back to him just to confirm that I'd taken possession of said package. Mm -hmm. And I tipped, the, I tipped the, the contents of the package out. There was a copy of the script. There was a, a mobile phone and some cash. <laughs> Why yeah. not in the wrong car? Is it? <laughs> in case you would be thinking you're, you're getting paid to kill someone or something like that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Burn a phone, you know. And, uh, but they, they gave me a phone that I could use all the time that I was there. Um, so that was amazing. So then I went to see Jamie and we walked around the, the back lot. Um, and it was it was amazing. I mean, they'd done they'd made interiors for some of those buildings. A lot of the others were were, were filmed on um, interior sets, studio sets, you know. But mm. that was a hell of an experience. To, the, to the, good, the good thing about that, I suppose, I mean, because of the way European cities are, like Budapest and Prague and stuff like this, they're very similar to what New York would have been in in the sort of in, in that time period. Um, yeah, I mean, been allowed to grow up like New York has. Yeah, so. I mean, they literally built this this from scratch. All these mm. these things. There was one scene that was actually shot in Budapest. Well, maybe more than one scene, but there was one particular scene that I was involved with that was actually filmed in Budapest at one of the old um, bathhouses there. One of the oldest ones in in Budapest, and these are really really old, fascinating places. Mm -hmm. um, but it was really hard for them to describe. They showed me some photographs of it and it was really hard for them to describe how the shots were going to be you know composed there so so i'd got a day off while i was um while they were working on other stuff so i actually went down to the to the bathhouse and and went in there like you know booked a session and went in mm. and to walk around and just like really absorb the atmosphere of the place and and look uh, how all the angles of these shots were going to work because the main bit with the main bath in the middle was uh hexagonal i think okay. so to work out how you're going to draw some of those shots i mean you could do it but and i and i now i would probably build a little computer model of it but but it was fascinating to to be able to go and look at the the location and just see what it was mm. what it was like and what it smelled like <laughs> <laughs> a bathhouse in Budapest. We won't ask you to describe it. <laughs> Amazing. Amazing. Um, yeah, so, so some great shows. Obviously, the, the, the thing we usually mostly want to talk about generally on this, apart from beer, is comics. So, and right. um, it's just, you know, comics work that you've done. As, as, as said just before you came on, um, I've, been, I've been a fan for many years um, from, from when you came in. As, as I know now, in 1988, when you came <laughs> in, I was I was six. <laughs> so you must have been you must have been about six. I think I was. I think I, I think I, I think I'd sent fan art into Transformers by then. So it's entirely possible I never got published. Though. I was going to say it's possible I was published in there before you, but never got published in it. But uh, yeah, uh, I, I was a, I was a massive fan of those Transformers comics all through the 80s and and into the early 90s and stuff like this. And um, yeah. Yeah, you, you, the art style was just absolutely perfect. So when did you get when did you get your start? Because that's some um, that's like I don't, I don't, being, when we've interviewed we've interviewed people that have um, and, and guests that have, have worked on sort of high profile projects like you know when, when, I don't know um, as a as a comic fan sort of I kind of in my in my sort of headcanon you've got you know your Marvel your DC your IDW your Image those are kind of your main your main yeah. three or four comic industry and obviously um uh, you've worked with them how at what point what point did you in your career do you consider you ha you, you had a break or were you moved up to that kind of level or you know yeah well I, I mean i originally i went to art college and i uh studied uh graphic design at art college but then i specialized in illustration but i worked as a graphic designer for a few years and and I was gradually getting to know people as part of a, a group that used to meet in London called the Society of Strip Illustrators. So in my yeah. last year of college, I joined as an associate member and I used to go into London once a month. Um, and there were some amazing people at that time. So that was like 
81, 82. 82 was my last year at college. Um, and so I was already at that stage in my not yet <laughs> developed career um, in conversations once a month with some amazing people. So the one of the two of the first people that I met then on, the, on those trips to London were David Lloyd and Dave Gibbons. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And so as this budding young artist, I went into one of these these kind of meetings. It was just a drink up, really, with comics people, you know. But um, I showed my portfolio. They, one of these guys said to me, you know, oh, have you got your portfolio? And I, and I showed them a work and they were saying, oh, you know, this, this bit's great, but this bit needs a bit of work here and that's there and that kind of thing. And, uh, and like any kind of young, fragile artist, <laughs> I was a bit kind of, yeah, whatever, you know, <laughs> about it all. But um, I didn't know at that time that that was Dave Gibbons who was giving me advice yeah. and I wasn't taking it. <laughs> but he, <laughs> he, he, was, he was a wonderful just, guy. And he, he a couple of years later, did you pick, like, Watchmen off the thing and go, oh, shit, <laughs> she listen to him. <laughs> yeah, and um, David Lloyd as well. So... The, that was a point that was before um around about the time that they were really beginning to push through so like david lloyd would bring in to the meetings he'd bring in you know pages of v and stuff like that and we'd mm. we'd have a look at them it was just amazing time to to begin just dipping yeah. my toe in so so while i was while i was um mixing with those guys i was also getting little bits of work with other publishers so i did a he-man comic strip for a company in manchester and you know bits and pieces like that so i was doing that in the evenings and during the weekend while i was still working as a graphic designer and so gradually the comics work got more and more and then i was asked to do a two-page tryout for thundercats at marvel uk Oh, well. um, and then, <clears throat> then they wanted me to, so they liked the samples that I did, so they wanted me to do more. So gradually I was doing more and more, and then and then eventually I got to the point, probably around about 88, I think it probably was 1988, where I worked out that I was at the point of earning the same amount of money working evenings and weekends for Marvel as I was earning as a full-time job as a graphic designer. So so I just dropped the graphic design thing and thought, yeah, know, this, this has actually possibly got legs to do this, keep on doing it. Yeah. And I used to pick up a lot of work from people who, other people who couldn't meet deadlines because they were overcommitted with too much work. Because I think for Marvel UK and some of those companies, it was hard to find... Because a lot of those things were weekly comics. It was hard to find yeah. them, keep up with the schedules. Unlike the American ones that were putting out once, once a month, the, the British comics, like your G.I. Joe, Transformers, yeah. plus Mighty World of Marvel, Spider-Man Comics Weekly and stuff like this, they, they, all, they always put them out weekly, so it must have been a massive... Yeah, and I think because we were all, you know, fairly kind of new to the game, I think it was hard to keep up the required pace. So I would pick up bits and pieces and just gradually... I honestly think I built my career initially on being a safe pair of hands. Like I would get it done on time, the end, you know, and the, and the best that I possibly could. But, but for any publisher, you know, the main thing is to not blow the deadline. Yeah. I mean, it's got to be printable, obviously. <laughs> yeah, be, yeah. Be rubbish. But it, it really is just treating it seriously as a, as a profession. And I, and I think that always, stood me in good stead you know that if they were stuck they knew that i'd, I'd get it done in time so i became reliable really um mm -hmm. and then so i was doing a lot of thundercats um for steve white and i went into the office occasionally i used to go down and drop off the pages of artwork in person rather than just post them down there so i went down to um I went down to the to Marvel UK in London with some pages of Thundercats and give them to Steve having a chat. And the guy next to him in the editorial office would kind of leant across and he was looking at the, the pages that I'd just given to Steve. And he said to me, Do you want do you want to book, draw some Transformers? And I, I didn't even know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, I was like, I don't know. I said yes to everything because I was young and keen, you know. I was like, yes, what is it? And he, and he told me what it was. And I was thinking, on the inside, I was thinking, I don't want to draw 
in robots. Like, why do I want? I want to draw superheroes. That's why I'm here. You know, they are superheroes. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Thundercats. Thundercats was great because it was the closest thing that Marvel UK had to superheroes at that yeah. time. Um, anyway, you wanted me to do these robots, so I, I did them, and and that that kind of started the. Uh, Kind of working relationship with Simon Furman, and and it just kind of solidified so that when he was invited over to write the American stuff, mm -hmm. and then when he was asked to find a British artist, he asked Jeff Senior, obviously because Jeff Senior had done it before I did. Um, so Jeff was drawing the book, um, and then Jeff wanted to come off of the book because he was going to do the Death's Head graphic novel, so he mm -hmm. wanted to, have to do that. So they. They asked me to try out for it, so they did, did a two-page sample, and they turned me down. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Oh fuck! I've blown my yeah. one and only chance to get into American Marvel." You know, but um, so they got one issue done, done by somebody else, which wasn't quite what they were after. So then they came back to me and said, "You can, you can do it. You know, yeah. that's, that's fine, and and just do it." Because I'd, I'd kind of reined in my style a bit. For the samples, I've made them look more like American Transformers artwork. Um, yeah. Toned it down a bit, but they came back to me and they said, "Okay, you've got the book and you can do it however you want." So I mm -hmm. did what some of the UK fans enjoyed about my work, which was, which was to make it more kind of organic looking, you mm -hmm. know, to imbue the characters with some kind of humanity. Mm -hmm. um, just can kind I of see some of, the, some of the pictures I'm putting up there, like um, for, uh, from a. Uh, AndrewWellman.net. Um, they, mm -hmm. uh, they 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 could be robots or they could be guys in suits. You know what I mean? There could be that's, some. Yeah, that's the way I approached it. I approached. Yeah. I thought if if in my mind they're guys in suits, you naturally draw them with, you know, the the same kind of dynamic as you would superheroes. So they they're imbued with sort of a more character by default, really. Yeah, I mean, when it, when it first started, the, the Transformers comic, I think it was back in 1982 or 83, something like that, there was a couple of different artists doing it, and, and, and you know, one of them would do some something similar to you and make them humanoid, and, and the other one would draw them almost as they were the toys. Um, and, yeah, I always much preferred, you know, the, the, the sort of humanoid sort of looking ones. Um, that, that, that we did. Like I, said, I was a massive fan all through, all through the eighties of that run. Um, so I've yeah. noted. Yeah, he's um, mm -hmm. uh, an amazing comic artist in his own right. He's uh, seen that those Transformer comics were absolutely amazing, but he was mesmerised by them, and he still has them close to his drawing board. And they're responsible for his love of comics and drawing, and still he still checks them out for inspiration. So yeah, take that for what it's worth, man. <laughs> Um, did you um you mentioned earlier about the am I right in thinking that Marvel UK I, I was watching a video about we um I'm a big fan of Mask. Do you remember Mask from the nineteen eighties? The yeah the, it was it was around about the same time as Transformers came out. And we yeah. um we managed to get Dave David Hugh on last last year um to chat about because he was the artist for um the UK run of Mask comics. Okay. Um mm. and he in my understanding that like Marvel UK was pretty much left to its own devices in terms of like storytelling and things like that. So for things like Transformers and that, they, you were, you know, it's, it's like whereas to now they would probably, they would, you know, IDW I think who who do it at the moment they they publish it and, and then try, um, import it over. Whereas right. at the in the in the eighties when you were involved, the, you know, your stuff was Transformers in in in, in, in the UK. Yeah, I I, I think. I think they were in a Marvel UK found themselves in a really fortunate position by accident as much as anything. And I think it's because um, although Marvel UK essentially under license were creating Marvel comics for the UK market and reprinting um, a lot of the American stuff, you know, they, they the business model meant that they could produce some originated strips. Not an awful lot, but they could produce some UK originated stuff. So, but because the Americans, they didn't really treat Marvel UK, um, well, no, they didn't take them seriously, but their eye wasn't on what was going in England. I mean, it was, you know, so small compared to the, the American market, that, so that they didn't really keep much of an eye on Marvel UK. 
and let them do whatever they want. And they would probably have to get the scripts approved, but, but Marvel US just thought, it's fine, as long as it doesn't break any of the continuity that we've got going, and as long as it doesn't break some fundamental rules, you can, you know, you can play about with it and do your own thing. And so when you, when you give that luxury to people like Simon Furman and, you know, Dan Abnett and whatever, some of the other guys that were, <laughs> were, were doing that stuff, it's like they're, they're real sort of sci-fi fanboys. So they, they took that opportunity to essentially take a, a toy book and write like a space opera, you know, that, <laughs> to do Alien or Star Wars or whatever. That's where their heads were. So, so they imbued a, a quite mature concept into something like Transformers. And that's ultimately what then caught the eye of the Americans. They were looking at, the, you know, they eventually were looking at stuff and thinking, these guys are doing amazing stuff. Like, why aren't we doing that? Yeah. Um, so obviously then when Simon was commissioned to write the, the US Transformers st stuff, it just, you know, I mean, just, it took it just took off. Yeah. Like, um, having a look at your work and, and reflecting on your career, uh, early 90s, you've got um, probably still one of the most beloved cartoons based on a, a comic comes out in like with, with the X-Men. So beloved that I'm right thinking that Disney Plus are doing a, uh, are doing a like another animated X-Men show oh, in, really? the, uh, in the style of, it's called like, I think it's called X-Men 99, am I right? Or 96? Yeah, yeah. X-Men 92 or 93 or something like that. I think that was when that sort of show came out. But yeah, they're, they're doing another season of that show. I don't know you did the, the comics of it. Yeah, yeah, that was because um, my my career essentially once I'd got my foot in the door at Marvel with Transformers. Although my first trip over to the offices in New York, um, I was <laughs> Rob Tokar, who was the editor on the Transformers book. He was like showing me around the offices and introducing me to different editors, and he'd say, "Hey, this is Andrew Wildman. He's come over from the UK." and whichever editor would say, oh, what's he working on? And he, and Rob would say, Transformers. And their reply, other editors, their reply was literally was, do we still do that book? I mean, they weren't interested. It was a toy book and they were trying to kind of cancel yeah. them, get rid of them. Um, so, so again, serious, serious artists, you know, the part of the Marvel stable weren't that keen on working on the toy books. So I jumped from um, Transformers onto G.I. Joe for that reason. Mm -hmm. um, and then you get this thing where, because editors work on different books, you know, they revolve around, and certainly assistant editors move around the offices working, you know, they'll work on something for a couple of years and they'll move on to another book. So you begin to get, you know, remembered by different people. Um, so that's why I got onto G.I. Joe, because the assistant editor on Transformers became the assistant editor on G.I. Joe. So he recommended it me for that. Um, Bobby Chase was the editor on G.I. Joe. She then um, was editor on The Hulk. So I picked up an issue of The Hulk. Cool. And so you just gradually get under yeah. the eyes of more people. Um, and then I think, I can't remember what I did after G.I. Joe. I think it was Black Cat, maybe. Oh, yeah. And so I was starting to get into the Spider-Man stable a bit. So I, then I did the Arachnus project, which is a six issue Spider-Man thing. Uh, so, you know, you just kind of expand your, your network. Um, the X-Men Adventures thing, actually that came just after, G that's what came after G.I. Joe. And for a while I was doing both books. So I was drawing two books a month, which was oh. absolutely <laughs> killing me. <laughs> um, but the the X Men thing was my first opportunity to 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 make another step towards drawing the proper Marvel characters. Mm -hmm. So although it was the animated book, so it wasn't part of the X Men universe as such. Oh, okay. Yeah. It was still the the opportunity to draw, you know, um, well, like you can see on that page there, to draw, you know, Rogue and Cyclops and Storm, and I mean, it was just such a joy to kind of put my my spin on some of those some of those characters um which again just gets you a little bit more noticed you know yeah mm -hmm. stunning man um 
totally like I hadn't I hadn't noticed or I hadn't really stopped to think about it until you just said it there today. But very um, like you're saying it's the it's the comic of the of the animated series, and it's yeah, it's, yeah that's an, it's a very. It was originally story. the book was originally going to be called X Men Animated. So you see at the top there. It says X Men Adventures, which is yeah. the title of the book, and then it says the issue number and the page number. Um, uh, I've still got I've still got quite a few of these pages, not that many, but I've still got some of these original pages left. And on the first, I don't know if it's for the whole of issue one, but certainly for the for a lot of them at the top, it actually it says X Men Animated, and then they changed it to X Men Adventures. So. Okay. But they hadn't so I was drawing the first issue and it's still going to be called X Men Animated. So um but uh, yeah, but it eventually it came out as X Men Adventures. But yeah, it was a fun that was a fun book to work on. And then I almost had the opportunity from that to work on Quasar because of the editor that was mm -hmm. uh, that was doing it, but then they gave it to I can't remember who they gave it to. Anyway, I didn't work on Quasar, and I moved on to. That's when I started to work on a couple of Spider-Man books. I was going to ask you about them. So, um, I I got made fun of actually. We were in the pub on Sunday, um, myself, Colin, and uh, Andrew, and uh, I got made no, not made fun of. I, I, I'm 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 maybe uh, making less of, making a, a more of an issue of it. But I'm, I'm a wee bit younger than the other guys, so. Uh, yeah. um, my, my 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 I get a wee bit more exuberant or a wee bit more excited about trying to new, do new things and all this sort of stuff. But yeah. um, uh, I was I, I was six when the first uh, the an X Men animated series came out and it was mind blowing. And then I, what I was about seven or eight when the Spider Man stuff came out. So mm -hmm. I think my first comic and I I don't have it and I'm totally raging. But my first comic was sort of mid nineties Spider Man and Venom sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, so I, I'm. I spent a period of this afternoon having a look at some of the stuff on on your website, trying to work out if um, my first foray into comics was you. Right. <laughs> so, but uh, I've got I've got some of your Venom stuff here because um, I just want to ask you that you're, you're, you were drawing Venom at probably the peak of sort of Venom mania. You know, like he he just been on the cartoon. Where the cartoon was a massive success in the states and, and the right. world. Yeah. The, the Venom thing for me is a, is a really strange one as well because the, I, I can't remember who the editor was on that book. Terrible, I can't remember. But it was written by Larry Harmer, who'd written G.I. Joe. So, so the connection was already there. So, you know, do you, want to, do you want to do some Venom that Larry's writing? It's like, yeah, I'd love to work with Larry again. So there was that already that kind of connection was there. Um. But so that's like a long time ago now, you know. I mean, I'm, I'm always I'm always chuffed by the fact that I worked on um, Venom. What was it called? Carnage Unleashed. Yeah. Um, but then somebody sent me a uh, a screen gra uh, sent me a photo on that they put on Facebook. Um, I think it was first on Twitter. Somebody had taken a photograph of the credits at the end of the of the latest venom movie and i get a, i get a credit at the end of the movie oh amazing <laughs> what seriously for, for carnage or for venom or <laughs> did you create oh, carnage you're saying <laughs> it was yeah, what um, was your credit yeah the, well the credit was just right at the very i'm the last name on the credit reel and mm -hmm. what it was was it was with thanks to um, and they'd listed, you know, the creators of Benham and Carnage and 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 the main people who had worked on books with Carnage in and and because I was one of those, just yeah. happened to be, and so I got a credit credit on That's the movie. Nice. Get, yourself, get yourself an IMDB page set up now. <laughs> oh, I've got one. <laughs> okay, well, of course you have for your work on the, the aliens and all the movies and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, so that was kind of funny just after all these years, you know, to get pinged up with a credit. <laughs> That's amazing. So could, is that enough that you could say as as seen on and then you can list that movie in your I, I don't know. I don't know how these things work. Yeah. You list yeah. It. One of your credits, isn't it? So yeah. 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 Um so yeah, um yeah, I'm trying to so I, I so how did so obviously you're um 
for for people or, or, um, that are right into comics. You're you're, you're part of that, and I always um, you're part of folks' history. You know, for you know, you're you're a massive part of, of sort of. I would say the, the cultural zeitgeist almost for for a lot of, for a lot of people. Um, you know, you have your place in people's like individual histories. I think. How does um? How did you go from comics to? Because you you you've you've done loads of work in in, in almost every industry. How how did you go from sort of to like? As I grew up, um, I was I became a massive Doctor Who fan, and um, obviously you you, you have him. Um, that uh, dinosaurs on a spaceship episode. Yes, yeah. it's a relatively iconic episode, and I know you've done other work on Doctor Who as well, but that was obviously the one yeah. that. I imagine most people would would recognize you from yeah yeah that's um <clears throat> again there's kind of a thread running running through how one thing led to led to another because it does seem like a it does seem like a bizarre portfolio career to move through all of those things and it wasn't wasn't necessarily got by design um so when the comics industry for me kind of came to an end with what's spider-man 2099 was my kind of my last of course, yeah. long -term marvel book and marvel were cancelling a lot of books then they marvel comics filed for what they call chapter 11 bankruptcy at that time um of course yeah. so they so they were dropping books and i i flew over to america just to try and pick up some more work um and I knew that I was coming off of Spider-Man 2099. Um, Nell Yomtov, who, who had been the colorist on Transformers, so I, I knew him quite well from that. He was the editor on a book called Fourth Works, which was written by Dan Ebnett, so mm -hmm. another British connection. But he, was, he said, I haven't got any work for you. He said, I can give you one and a half issues of force works he said because the artist has moved on he can't finish the penultimate one so if you can finish that one up then he said i'll give you the last one because the book's being cancelled and that final issue of force works i still think is my best best comics work that i ever did oh, and wow. it was kind of born out of desperation as much as anything it was like my last chance to make an impression on the guys who were doing the comics that were going to survive, you know, the proper X-Men books and, and Avengers books and all that kind of thing. Um, but it, it didn't swing it. So, I, I mean, I, I worked on a couple of other things. Nightman I did, which was a lot of fun. But And then back in the UK, I, I worked on some Action Man and some Power Rangers. But the comics thing was disappearing for me. And at a comics convention in... in in the bar at the end of the convention where all the creators just go and get pissed. <laughs> I, I got chatting to this guy. I didn't even know who he was. He was just part of the group that we were hanging out with. And we were just talking about movies and comics and all sorts of stuff. And I didn't even know who he was. And then a couple of weeks later, I got a phone call from a games company that said, do you want to do some um, concept art for a computer game? And the guy that I had been talking to at the convention was... Jason Kingsley, who's the CEO of Rebellion Games. Oh, well. Um, yeah. <laughs> so it's just these connections that you very often unknowingly you make and people remember you, you know. So, so, I did, so I started to do some bits and pieces of freelance work for them. And then they asked me to actually go full time with them to design characters and environments and all sorts of stuff. And that's when I did my first storyboarding. So I used to storyboard. The little cutscenes that come up in games, oh, yeah. um, those kind of things. So I'd storyboard those just because I was the in-house guy who could draw stuff, you know. Um, Have you got anything? Then, so Andrew, Andrew is a big comic. Yeah, Andrew is a, as well as a comic book fan. I know Andrew likes his games. Have you got anything that you can that you're particularly <laughs> proud of? That you're or or if you is there a cutscene that you're like, oh, folk talk about that still or? I the, the the thing about it was though I was not a game player I didn't really know anything about games but I knew how to design characters and, mm. and environments so so I would just make stuff up and they would build it as best they could you know sometimes they would say look you can't do this in a because there were a lot of limitations in games then you know the whole kind of low poly thing that you had to yeah. build games as economically as possible in terms of polygons. Um, 
So I would just chuck in the ideas and I, I, I kind of almost didn't completely ignore the technology, but I, I said to them, I'm not going to let a knowledge of the technology hold me back because otherwise then we're going to underplay what's possible. If I just design characters and environments that are best in terms of design and narrative, then it's for you to do the best version that you can of that. And that, that was quite a good working relationship then because it, it enabled them to really push the boundaries on how few polygons they got to play with. You know. uh, clever. It encouraged them to be a wee bit more creative as well, didn't it? You know, like just, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I worked on, because um, it was Rebellion, I worked on Dread versus Death. And um, I did, a, there was an Alien versus AVP Gold. I did some stuff on that. Mm -hmm. There was a, a very short-lived game called Gunlock that was in in development for like four years or something. And we did an absolute ton of work on it, um, and it didn't quite do as well as it as yeah. it should have done, really. But you know, but there we go. Um, so I was I was with Rebellion for about three years, I think, and then. And then I, I left Rebellion and I did little bits of comics. I did some more Transformers for DreamWorks and, you know, all sorts of bits and pieces. Of course, yeah. um, And then I worked for another games company. Um, but then quite a number of years after that, when I was... I left Rebellion in 2003, and it was probably nine years or so after that. I got a phone call from somebody who I used to work with at Rebellion. And in those intervening years... He'd left Rebellion and he'd developed and set up his own company in London that do visual effects, you know, mm -hmm. computer generated visual effects for TV. And he was yeah. really successful at it. You know, I'd completely lost touch with him. But he rang up and he said, you used to do storyboards at Rebellion, didn't you? And uh, I was like, yeah, yeah. And he said, do you want to do some storyboards for a TV show that I'm working on? I was like, yeah, cool. So I went into London and met with the director and it was a, it was a BBC Three um, kind of horror TV show called The Fades. Um, and it, it was amazing, you know, the, yeah. just work with the director and, you know, visualize all this stuff. Um, but that was it. I did that gig and I, you know, there was nothing else coming my way. But then about 18 months after that, I got a phone call from the director that I'd worked with because we'd gotten so well. And he said, oh, hi, it's Farron. Do you want to do some more storyboards for me? I was like, yeah, fantastic. What is it? And he said, Doctor Who. I <laughs> <laughs> was, you know, his, his, his career had finally taken him to something that he was really, really interested in. Mm -hmm. So um, so that was my foot in the door with Doctor Who. So I did the, the it was one of those Christmas special ones with Farron. Um, it was set in like this tower and there was this wood, giant wooden King. Oh yeah, so the one with um, it's the one with the girl from oh, uh, Bill Bailey's in that one, I think, isn't he? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um, I'm trying to. Um, I, f I forget the actress who's in it, but she was. Is it? Is it maybe Joanna Page? Did I make that up? Um, I forgot to check. Just a Joanna Page, just a girl from Gavin and Stacey. Yeah. Is it the Gavin? I can't remember. No, I'm, I'm going to have to go and check that out. Before yeah. that, it's a really nice episode and visually stunning. So you know. Yes, and and I. I loved working on that. And then just because the people in the production office liked the boards that I'd, I'd done, if ever they were getting a, a director in to direct a block of Doctor Who and, and if they hadn't got their own storyboard artist, they would, they would always give it to me. So I did most of Matt Smith's final season. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where I met Jamie Payne, who I've done all this other stuff with, like Luther and mm -hmm. the, you know, the Alienist and all that kind of thing. Um, so again, it was kind of like it was by it wasn't by design. It was just luck and people that I knew, and then gradually kind of nurturing those those relationships. I, I always say, obviously, when people say it was kind of luck, I was I was always reminded of like it was, it was a football quote or something like that, where people say, you know, the harder they work, the luckier they get. And yeah, you, know, you, you always worked hard, like you say, you always you were reliable and stuff like this. We call it luck, but. You know, people obviously trusted you to do the work. So, yeah, and and also I think because I I do um, lecturing in universities and stuff mm -hmm. as like a guest lecturer and and talk about that kind of stuff. And the thing that I say to people who are moving, well, any career really, but certainly through the arts, the commercial arts, you know, like I've done 
with publishing and screen and all sorts of stuff. Um, I quote to them something that my the first producer I worked with in children's TV. Um, when I first worked in children's TV, I said, I want to do some more of this. How do, how do I do it? And he said, just develop your contacts. But he said, just be great with everyone. Just be the person that they want to work with again because they enjoyed working with you. Like you, being good at what you do is a given. You know, you've got you've got to deliver the the goods. But he said, just just be somebody who they get on well with and that listens to what they need and all that kind of stuff. And and it's really true. I think developing those relationships as a good working relationship is equally, if not more, important than the the quality of the work that you you put in because it's all quick and dirty most of that work it's got a function but mm. you've got to give them what they need and you can give them what they need if you listen to what they're asking yeah and that's I, think, I, think, I think it's a really important job though particularly if like i don't know if you if, if as as somebody that um i i like to write comics but i'm not very good at visualizing um so I imagine if, if if you're a director for and you've got you've got shots or you've got concepts and it's just getting them out so in in in, in a in a format so, so you can so it exists and then you can you've got something to work from. I imagine yeah. you like your storyboarding is an essential part of the process, you know, is of that creative process. And um, it really it is. Just, it means to have a storyboarder. <laughs> I mean, not, not all directors use storyboards. The, the the essential storyboards usually come about when there are stunt sequences. Mm -hmm. um, so they've got to be co anything with choreography. So stunts, work with animals, um, car chases, anything that has any kind of element of choreography. You know, they usually need storyboarding so that all the pe all the crew who are going to manage that know what what the shot's going to look like. Um, so that'll be the stunt coordinators and the wranglers who are handling the animals and the stunt drivers and all that kind of stuff. Um, the, and so there's, there's choreography, then there's um, special effects. So that's like explosions and all that kind of thing, like in-camera effects. Because very often you only get one take with those things, especially if there's fire and <laughs> stuff involved. So they need that storyboarded so they can get that shot because they're not going to get a second chance. And then the other one is visual effects. So that's all like post-production stuff, computer graphics that they need and, you know, special effects, all that kind of uh, visual effects. Um, and usually that's done, A, so they can visualize it, but B, so they can cost it out because the director might have an idea, but until it's seen on paper, they can't go to the VFX company mm. and cost it out and let them know how much it's going to cost to build that model and, incorporate it into the shot you know yeah. especially it's a moving camera all those kind of things so that that's where boarding is essential and then some some directors just like it from a mood point of view because they can't get across to the you know the dop or the or the whatever and some of the other people involved with the actual shoot they can't get across the the styling and the mood so they ask you to board some of those sequences just so that mm -hmm. They can begin to feel how that is going to go. Hmm. Um, well, so yeah, so it, it really yeah. was. It, it really was just luck going, uh, hopping from one to the other. Yeah. I imagine he's you know, another guy that you spend a lot of time working with, because um, you have seen, you, you, you know, if the director says this is what I want, and then you storyboard it, and then it's down to the DOP to to make it real, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, and it's a, it's a bit of a back and two process. So you'll have a meeting, talk through it, and then I usually come back to my my studio and then sort of sketch it up fairly rough, um, email it over, and they'll say, yeah, that's great, but can you go wider on this shot? Yeah, that's great, but can you shoot it? We're going to shoot it further further around. Can you redraw that, whatever. Can you sort that panel with that one? You know, just get it, get it all set mm -hmm. out, send it off again. And then they'll be like, "Yeah, that's it." And then you clean it up, get it as 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 nice and tidy as time will allow, um, so that they can then present it to whoever needs to see it. <laughs> cool, cool. So, um, how much say do you have 
in the storyboard. So obviously you're being asked to create things. Do you ever do you ever have to through either necessity or convenience, do you have to add things that have maybe not been in the original ask, the original brief, just because otherwise it would be impossible or uh it, it varies it varies on the director. Some some are quite prescriptive they know what they want they ask you to sketch it up and they don't necessarily even want it to be cleaned up after that it's just like a uh, like an aid memoir you know it just reminds them of what they're supposed to be doing and it's enough for them to show the rough sketches and tell people what the things that are missing um some directors like it to be clearer and clearer because it helps their thinking process mm. and as often as not it helps them see what doesn't work mm -hmm. it's almost like a test shoot on paper and yeah. they're like yeah that's i i thought it would work but it doesn't work now that i've seen it and then they'll come up with something that something else some i there is there are a couple of directors who i've got to know or worked with a lot to the point that sometimes we'll be going through scenes and they'll describe it and then we'll get to another scene and they'll they'll kind of give me a couple of pointers and they'll say just do whatever you think and then i'll just do it and they're like yeah we'll shoot it like that nice. <laughs> um That's but amazing. that only works because because as the board artist you've got to the point where you are literally in the head of the director like you know how they think you know the, the longer you work with someone i suppose the less the less he'll have to tell you how he wants it to look he'll yeah. sort of rely on you to to know how it works sort of thing yeah just because they have a particular style and you know that when they say can we have a wide shot looking down that street some mm -hmm. director you know that they'll want it cranked over to slightly one side so you're getting a bit of a yeah. you know bit of an angle on it mm -hmm. and some directors you know that they always punch it straight down the middle that it's literally going to look down the street yeah, yeah, we, we, we talked about like Wes Anderson and things like that, that there are certain directors that you know exactly how they're going to frame yeah. and, and it's kind of their, their signature sort of, you know, move and things like that. So, Yeah, some, some directors use a lot of handheld, some like just like slow kind of creeping shots, you know, mm. you just kind of get to know what their style is. To have, to, to have a knowledge of all that is quite incredible. Like, um, it, you know, to have to develop, I find that um, to develop a working knowledge of that must it must be quite hard. But you know, that's 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 pretty incredible. Can I? How do you um? So it's sort of and 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 I sort of head canon. Uh, toward, I want you, how you you've you you've obviously created stuff. You've got. I would like to talk with you about the graphic novels that you've done, and obviously, yeah. well, I have to talk about Shane the Chef. <laughs> <laughs> um, but. Uh, Oh, these are these are your babies. You've got you know you've got creative, uh, you've you input on these things. Obviously, you co-created Shane, and obviously your um, mm -hmm. how how has that has that been something you've always done alongside? Obviously, if you're doing um, art, if you're doing storyboards, you're having to follow someone else's vision. So, I've not. I've always had ideas, and you know, I've I kind of dabbled in the edges, but. I think there's, there's never seems to be enough time to do that that stuff. And even if there was time back in the day, even if there was time to do your own stuff, how you were actually going to present it to people was a, you know, it's nigh on impossible. Where, I mean, now with, you know, print on demand and the internet and all sorts of things like that, you, you can do work and present it quickly. You can get it on the internet really fast. You can get stuff digitally printed. So it's a lot easier. So that encouraged me to to actually do my own kind of graphic novels. Um, so I just kind of found time. Shane, Shane was a, I don't know, it was, it was kind of a, an accident in a way. Um, when I first started working in children's TV, um, for a company in London, I was just designing characters and things like that. And it was one Christmas or Easter, I can't remember which, we were sitting around the dinner table, me, my wife, um, my two daughters, who were teenagers at the time, and my son, who was a teenager, and he was an apprentice chef, so he couldn't be there, he was having to work, you know. And um, so I was talking about the, the kids show that I was working on, and my daughters were, were just like reminiscing about 
the kind of shows that they liked when they were little and the books, you know, so they were talking about Postman Pat and all that kind of stuff. So, so my wife said, um, cause she thinking about the you know, missing our son cause he couldn't be with us. She said, you know, those shows like Postman Pat and Bob the Builder and all that kind of thing. She said, why hasn't anybody ever done one about a chef? And it was like, so that's like, <laughs> Yeah, it was one of those moments. So the following day, I typed out a treatment and did some little sketches of characters. And then when I was back into the studio in London on this kitchen I was working on, I showed it to the producer and I said, what do you think of this? And he was like, that is such a good idea. So he put me in touch with a couple of people um, and we almost got it picked up by the BBC. Um and then they, it fell at the, at the final hurdle. Um, and then it just kind of lay dormant for a while. And then eventually um, a company in London, like a rights management company showed interest with it. And they, they really believed in it. They believed in the, the message of, you know, fresh food is best and all that kind of mm -hmm. stuff. And they pushed and pushed and pushed and pushed until eventually after quite a lot of years, <laughs> um, got it picked up by channel five yeah so then we went into production is it, is it still in production or was it a, is it something you're still working on is it something you're still working on or was it no so we did the 52 episodes season mm -hmm. one kids shows are usually 52 episodes um so we did all of that they're still trying to get a season two channel five want to do it mm -hmm. But the thing about kids' shows, especially a show like that, um, is raising the finances. Mm -hmm. Just nigh on impossible. It's amazing that shows ever get made, really. The amount of funds you have to raise to, you know, yeah. get investment, people to believe enough in it. So so we still hope that there will be a season two. So there's a couple, of, a couple of big names in the in, in the voice things, you know, guys like yeah. John Thompson and Russell Dovey. Yeah, and, Russell Dovey, yeah. yeah, he's a he oh, shit, isn't he? <laughs> I, went, I went to one of the recording sessions with with Russell, yeah, and it was just amazing to see him in the recording booth. And you know, well, again, you're talking being fans. I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm a big fan of Gavin and Stacey, and, and he did them um, being human, and, and um, you know, he's, he's, he's I think Russell Tovey's marvelous, and he's just a great, great actor. Nobody strikes me as a really, really nice guy. Yeah, um, whenever you see him as well, so he was he was perfect, really. The, the, yeah. I mean, when I, when I hear him on anything else, it's just shame. Yeah, all <laughs> oh, you can see now. <laughs> yeah, well, he was he, he was on Arrow and Flash, for, he must have been on Arrow and Flash for about ten years. He did, he did that. He was he was, um, was, was like 2017-18 was kind of yeah. That. So it was, it was like a flash forward episode in the future, set in the future where he was. Um, he was, he was the Ray or something like that, I think, a yeah, guy yeah, yeah. who could become totally made of made of energy. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, he did, he did a few episodes of that. Yeah. That was yeah, really great. Yeah. So you've, got, um, you've done your own graphic novels as well. Um, you're writer and artist, illustrator yeah. on them, aren't you? Um, yeah. I, I, I think I'd like to talk about, particularly about Horizon, because, like, um, I'm yeah. on the, I'm on the, 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 the the, you know the page that anyone goes to andrewwellman.net and, and and clicks on Horizon, you'll be able to buy from there. But you know we talked about Dave Gibbons earlier, you know comic laureate and you know one of the one of the biggest names in comics, British yeah. comics at least ever. And he's he he's in his review of your work, it's what a fascinating and thrilling journey through the psyche, simultaneously mm. thoughtful and kinetic. So you know can't really <laughs> you know I'm just nodding all right if, if that, that's what Dave Gibbons says, you have to go in. <laughs> Say, yeah, yeah I, I sent him a copy. I mean, obviously, I've known Dave for a long time. Uh, paths don't cross very often, but he's just such a lovely guy. I set up a charity project a number of years ago, and you know, he donated artwork for us to raise money for charity and all sorts of stuff. Horizon came about because i i did a I did a series of seminars in London, participating in sem seminars about you know, personal development is all about life coaching and, you know, breaking through things that stop you in life and all that kind of thing. And eventually I trained to be a coach as well. Um, and out of that experience, 
I, I wanted to produce a graphic novel that was that was like an adventure story, but also the, the, the purpose of the narrative was to be able to take a character on a journey that had breakthroughs in the things that were challenging them using the coaching techniques that, I, that I'd learned and that had provided breakthroughs for me. Mm -hmm. um, and it went through a number of different versions. Um, and originally I had the idea and then I had um, a couple of different writers in mind and they, uh, they were, we were, we were going to do it and we were going to do it in, in conjunction with a band. In fact, three, it went through three different bands whose lyrics we were going to use to pepper through the story to kind of help the narrative. Mm. Uh, and that didn't, originally it was going to be uh, Marillion, because I know a couple of the awesome. band members. Mm -hmm. um, and they, they seriously kind of looked at it. It was, it was a completely different, it wasn't Horizon, but it was kind of similar. Um, and then we, they decided not to go ahead with that. And then I got in touch with um, Crispian Mills of Cooler Shaker. So I had a couple of meetings with Crispian and he was really interested in it. But again, it didn't, didn't get past his management and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and then I, I reached out to a couple of people on um, MySpace. You remember MySpace, the old social yeah, yeah. media? <laughs> Yeah, people. I reached out to <laughs> there, and then and then I never looked at MySpace, you know, for a long time, like a lot of people did. And eventually, I dipped back into it uh, while it still existed. Um, and I'd completely missed a message from um, oh, what's the name, the Francis, I can't remember, the lead singer from Travis. Oh, um, he got back in touch with me, and he was interested in it. In yeah. it. And then, never find my way back to getting into communication with him again anyway so then it was just going to be done without the lyrics um so i was talking to a writer and a, and a, and they didn't quite get it and then i was talking to uh, another friend of mine she works in children's publishing she's a writer illustrator and she said to me why don't you just write it yourself and i was like because well, i'm not a writer and she said these are your characters all you've got to do is put the words in their mouth. You know the story. You just need to breathe life into them. So, so I thought, yeah, fuck it, I'm going to do it myself. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I did, and it was a joy. It took a long time to do it, and so when I'd finished it, um, yeah, I sent copy off to Dave and a few other people, and I went on the on a radio show with Will Gompertz, the BBC Arts editor spoke to him about it and they, they just sent back these little kind of quotes you know and uh, that they said yeah you can use this if you want for like marketing purposes <laughs> i'll do that then <laughs> so, so it's you know it's very kind of in a way it's under the radar but i sell it at conventions and sell it off the website and and i'm i'm happy with that it's just like it, it exists yeah this and it, get, it gets great feedback Oxygen came about because Oxygen follows a similar format in a way. It's a different story, but it's similar in as much as it's a single character with a companion going through a number of challenges um, that they have a sort of an epiphany about who they are in their life. Um, but I realized that Horizon... Oh, it doesn't sell as well at conventions as I would like. There are certain people who pick it up, love it and buy it. There are a lot of people that pick it up. And when they say, what's this about? Because they, they're fascinated but with Horizon. As soon as I say to, you know, like a, a sci-fi fan, I say, well, it's about a 15 year old girl. They're like, they just, they're not interested. Yeah. And, and that's fine because it's not their thing, you know? So I thought, okay, well, how, how about if I do another book, but, make it more kind of sci-fi based mm. and it's it's already catching a, a different a different audience you know all the ones that didn't read horizon their their version of that kind of thing is is oxygen so i've got well about three issues out of the moment there are seven in total and then it'll be collected as a book so um yeah what's the, what's the, so 
Oxygen's a totally different baby, you said, isn't it? So it's not like what um, I, I had a little look online about it, um, and um, I'm, I'm hooked, and I'm, I'm going to have to get a copy. But um, when I think, uh, or or just buy each issue as they come out. But um, the um, it's about an astronaut that finds himself kind of stuck on a, on yeah. a strange planet that, as well as physically being a, a challenging place for him to navigate, it's it also there, there's elements that are playing with his like his mind and his psyche as well, isn't there? Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Again, well, I mean, I can't. I'm not going to give away anything about it, but it, it does have more of a. There are certain things in there that are that are really are a mystery. I mean, the, the opening pages are like, what the hell's going on there? You know, um, and then in issue three, yeah, yellow. Um, there's a scene in that in the middle where, where there are certain little narrative boxes, or so, I can't remember certain narrative boxes where there are things that said that will be completely clear when you get to the end. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because not it's like with horizon at the end of horizon, the end of oxygen is not going to be the same as the end of horizon, other than that when you get to the end, there's more to what you were seeing than you realized at the time. You know, horizon was yeah. like there's this kind of reveal moment at the end where she where the, the camera <laughs> in inverted commas goes into her bedroom and turns back and looks at a wall where there's a poster that you hadn't seen before. Mm-hmm. You've seen it right at the beginning on the wall, but you, you, just, you don't know what it is. And that kind of, that's the, the, that kind of reveals what Horizon is. But there's also, the, there's a trigger point in Horizon where she's talking to her therapist, where the therapist asks her to write down stuff in her book. And when the therapist describes to her how to write it, um it the idea is that it triggers you to go back to the book mm. and read it in a in a way where you realize what's going on that you haven't yeah. seen before mm. that's narratively really intriguing that that's that's quite exciting yeah, yeah. Uh, obviously dave gibbon seems to think so as well <laughs> <laughs> um, um so yeah and then it just sounds like you're you're such a busy dude. <laughs> There's just so much stuff going on. It's um, because um, obviously you do the conventions and that as well, don't you? You um, yeah, not as many as I used to. I I used to do a lot. Um, obviously lockdown kind of you know yeah didn't help with that. Um, I was going to be at Thought Bubble at the end of last year, um, but I had to cancel that because I had to go yeah. to America. You know, with family issues. Um. So I couldn't do Thought Bubble, but I'm, I'm doing, I'll possibly do Thought Bubble this year, and I'm probably going to do the Lakes Festival. Yeah. Um, I'm not, I'm not down to do any others. I just, I'm just, I'm just too busy. <laughs> I'd love really? to do more, but you know, because oh, like, time is, <laughs> time is kind of precious for me, in as much as. Obviously, I enjoy doing all the film stuff and the TV stuff, but I, I cannot get through oxygen as quickly as I'd like. Mm-hmm. I'm so keen to get on that. There was a time with Horizon where I, I had a good chunk of time on it, and I was following Alice Ann almost through her journey in real time. I was drawing the pages so quickly mm-hmm. that, you know, but. But it's not like that with oxygen it's taking a, a lot longer and i can imagine that's quite frustrating as well like when obviously you're yeah. you your um your whole your whole career has been built around um <laughs> deadlines and stuff like that to like not be meeting your own uh, it must be quite frustrating yeah. but i think i'm getting to an age where i deserve a bit of my own time <laughs> don't you i mean clearly i'm as oh. old as methuselah <laughs> Oh, why? What have you done? What have you what, what have you done that's made you think that? <laughs> I just got old, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, we're a we're a beer and comics podcast, and uh, I, I I I talked you through my uh, um, we do that preamble pretty much with every guest just to make sure that we don't bring in a comics guest who is abstaining from has has abstained from alcohol their entire life and we're all boozing, or um or to to have a to have somebody from a brewery who hasn't looked at a comic. In their life, 
Um, but right. yeah, you are you do enjoy a bit of a beer. <laughs> You're... I do enjoy. I do enjoy beer. We've got a local brewery where I live called um, the Hook Norton Brewery. I mean, really? you can get it all over the place, but the the brewery is actually based just um, just a few miles down the road. So the local beer here is is uh, Hooky, as they call it. Um, that's that's a good beer. I like that. Um, I do like London Pride. I do like Brewdog occasionally, but it's one of those beers that you really like, and then you kind of go off it for a while. Yeah, um, you're, 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 yeah, you do. Like uh, uh, we we talk like I remember when um we first started in the podcast. It was, it was just me and Colin. We spent a lot of time kind of avoiding things that were were quite easily accessible. Uh, I, I, um, sort of maybe made up history slightly differently, but um, I do sort of recall Andrew bringing Brewdog on, and that maybe even being the first time Brewdog was ever on the podcast was when Andrew brought it on. Um, yeah. And we had a discussion about it, particularly their Punk IPA. Is yeah. is a really just a really good beer, but um, you do every so often. Like I, I drink it every so often, and you do have a wee swig. You're like, mm, that tastes like not being very good to your employees. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think I, like I, obviously they had that whole problem with how they, they treated their employees and it's all right to it. But at the same time, they, they did they did bring IPA is like possibly my favourite beer, and they did make IPA um, trendy again. Mm. You know, for, for 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 many for years for, for decades probably IPA was. You know, it was, it was something that old men drank, and, and it wasn't like me. No, no, much older than you. <laughs> I thought you saw the camera voice. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, my my feeling about the first time I drank punk IPA was it was a number of years ago. It must have been like fairly recently on the market. It was in a it was in a restaurant in what restaurant. Sounds a bit posh. It wasn't anyway <laughs> in uh, in Brighton, and you know I wanted some beer, and they'd got it, so we tried it, and it was like, "Whoa, what's this? It's amazing." Mm-hmm. Um, but I think I tend to kind of get a bit blasé about it, but then so I don't drink it for a while, but then I like it when I have it again. You get yeah. that initial kind of like, "Oh yeah, it is good," but you know, um, yeah, it's like it. It's, it's, it's become like that mass-produced beer now that I try and find I try and find small batch IPAs and. And smaller, yeah. smaller brewery IPAs um, now, and, and try as many as I can. Um, yeah, we've got we've got some nice, nice breweries um, up here. In that, where I'm on the edge of the Cotswolds, so there's quite a few. Thing, yeah. Um, so yeah, beer's beer's good. Um, I like a drop drop of whiskey as well, which is not. Yeah. I'm not I'm not not a whiskey person for being for being from Scotland. It's not my. I think I just I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Never learned to like it. I think it's, it's something which takes a wee bit of effort when you first start drinking it, and I just um, always, always rather would rather have a beer. Yeah, fair enough. No, beer's good. Beer's oh. good. I am. Um, I'm drinking I'm water drink- at the moment just to let you down. I'm drinking. <laughs> I don't know. Don't be Andrew was letting us down last week. It's okay. <laughs> yeah. I, I was. I, I've had I'm just in recovery. I just recovered from a batch of COVID over over Christmas and New Year, so last, last last week I was still feeling a wee bit tender, so I didn't drink at all. Um, nearly got myself thrown off the show, I believe. Yeah, we were, there was a, a final writ of warning issued. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, um, I, I wanted to give a shout out to um, Alchemy Brewing, just while we were on the show, because um, mm. they're not a brewery that I'm, I was massive familiar with, but I think I'm going to have to do my checks as we go. Um, I, do, I, I often check as we talk, so um, in making sure that um, I, I'm not like giving out wrong information, it was Claire Skinner <laughs> who was in that episode of the Doctor Who that we talked about earlier. Who was okay. the mother? She was the mother in a what was the program she was in with a uh, Hugh Dennis and the yeah uh, with the kids that one yeah yeah yeah, um, yeah so that in a uh, Alchemy Brewing I think they're a lovely um they're a lovely I've, I've, yeah they're based in Livingston in Central Scotland. Um, they we have a we have a it's funny that uh, Andrew may make uh, you're probably the only guy I know that makes fun of camera quite a lot, <laughs> which is what the uh, like you would go to beer festivals and stuff like this, and there was there was these everywhere you went were the same guys, big beards and you know and, and big sweaters drinking pints. <laughs> I started calling them camera chunky sweater bastards. Um, but the thing is, I, I didn't see, and, and this is the point I've made a few times. I didn't really see the point of camera much anymore. Like the camp at the time, 
every pub in, in Scotland sold the same three or four beers. And I'm, I'm assuming, actually, it wasn't much the same in England. England always had a better, um, a better tradition of local breweries being in locally owned pubs and things like this. We didn't have that in Scotland. All we had was tenants and and Belhaven and stuff like this. But Cameron have won. Yeah. Like there's 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 real ale now in every pub in the world, or every pub in Britain at the very least. Um, you know, the, 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 they're more popular now than they've ever been. Mm. Um, this campaign to save real ale isn't necessary anymore. It's like we've won. We can tuck away our chunky sweaters and our, you know, yeah. our, our things like that, and and just retire. Just enjoy the beer. Yeah. Enjoy it and just enjoy the beer that you can get everywhere. So we've got we've we've got a I think it's locally recognised as the Camera Pub in Dunfermline, which is a commercial. It's a lovely mm-hmm. it's a lovely pub. Um, and me, Colin, and Andrew met there on Sunday, and they've got Alchemy on tap at the moment. It's Alchemy beers on tap, and I, they have it's Origin is the name of one, and I'll need to get the other the name of the other one. It was um it was like a malt ale. It was a, a stout, uh, and it was it was beautiful. And I just think uh, if you haven't checked them out any yet, go and check out Alchemy because I think they're a new brewery from from Central Scotland, and they're, I think they'll be making a bit of noise in the next. Um, Andrew, um, it's been absolutely amazing having you on. Um, uh, thank you so much for getting back in touch with me. Um, that was I was a, I was a, I get quite a lot of I send quite a lot of emails out to potential guests who say I will get in touch with you later, and they don't. So I was really, really I was quite moved when you got back in touch with me. Because um, you, you are you are a comic creator that I've um, and a comic personality that I've wanted on the show for a long time. Um, yeah, it's it's my pleasure. I mean, I, I I like doing this kind of stuff. I like that's why I like doing conventions and going to universities and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Because I remember how difficult it was for me. A growing up, even being able to get hold of comics yeah. was <laughs> was difficult. Then to try and forge a career into it or find other people that were interested or that worked in the industry to just chat about it was just really, really difficult. Yeah, um, I, you, I can see I'm, I'm a bit, maybe about 10 years younger than you and there was only one comic shop in the part of Scotland that I lived in. So I can imagine back in the 19, early 80s, was there a comic shop anywhere that you could you could go to and, and you know, buy um, There was no such thing as comics shops when i was growing up i guess the first one i went when i was at college in leicester there was there was one there um but it was trips into london and even then forbidden planet was in a in a basement in denmark street yeah. you know it's like um so like i was saying about having the the pleasure of meeting people like dave gibbons and david lloyd and brian bolland and alan moore and all those guys mm. you know when i first started was great so so i'm more than happy to talk to people about this stuff because people want to talk about it and hear about how it works and how it starts and yeah, how yeah. You do it and all that kind of stuff so we're on um it's, it's hopefully like obviously i, ho- I hope to catch it thought bubble last year um and was obviously it wasn't able to for different reasons um i hope that uh we we, we absolutely as a podcast intend to be at thought bubble next year so uh, this year i should say november so Hopefully we'll catch you then and we'll grab a pint with you and stuff. It'd be really nice. Um, and if, thank we're, you for, if we're not there tabling, we'll definitely be there guesting and we'll be wandering about with a recorder getting, uh, <laughs> getting quotes and things like that anyway. So. Um, yeah. But until, until, yeah, totally. until, until then, um, if anybody wants to catch up on your work, do you have any specific places that you would you would like folk to go to to make sure that they, they can access your... Yeah, you know? well, um, well, the website, so andrewwildman.net or apwildman.com i mean you'll find it just type andrew wildman into a search engine you'll find it but i'll put stuff up on instagram facebook not so much but yeah any of those guys i'm there <laughs> I, mean, I don't i don't do much on twitter though so don't not not worth going there because i won't reply <laughs> cool or myspace yeah, yeah. I keep looking. There's nobody. There. I just, I love the fact that Fran Healy has a uh, has messaged you, and you've missed it because you just didn't go on MySpace. <laughs> as 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 um, as a Scottish based podcast, you know, um, I, I, I was laughing already when you were talking about Marillion and, and Kula Shaker and stuff like that because um, I'm going through personally. I'm going through a big like mid to late nineties revival with my music tastes just now, and they're coming up constantly. So, and then you said, Fran, you know, I was like, 
I just love this idea that the guy from Travis is like, that's a great idea. And then it just went out into the... He didn't hear much from Marillion any, anymore. But I, I, when I was a student, I worked in the spa in a place called Haddington just down the road um, right. with, where Fish lives. Yeah. And um, he used to come in for his milk and stuff like this. And he's absolutely the most massive person I've ever met in my entire life. He must be about six foot. I think I was quite young at the time, but he appeared to be about six foot ten. <laughs> just massive. <laughs> six foot thirteen, yeah. Yeah. No, I mean they've been around for years. They've got a new album coming out yeah. this this back into this year, I think. Um, yeah, I mean Fish did four albums, but they've done so many albums with Steve Hogarth since nineteen eighty nine. Mm. They're yeah. amazing, and they still they're still very very relevant. Really, are very very relevant. Um, yeah, wow. I just had the I just got lucky enough to get to know a couple of them. In fact, Mark Kelly, the keyboard player, has got a um, page of my original Spider-Man artwork. <laughs> oh, amazing. <laughs> That's cool. Um, yeah. Wow, amazing. Right, um, we're going to probably bring it to a close. We're trying to keep things yeah. up. Early. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, 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 I will hope to go catch up with you really, really soon. Um, it was uh, a pleasure meeting you. A pleasure getting to talk to you. Martin needs to say that uh, Misplaced Childhood is a great album and that needs to be talked about. <laughs> um, uh, ne next week, our, uh, we're, we're going to be really um, just absolutely so honoured to be welcomed by so many amazing people from the, the world of comics and the world of beer. Um, next week, we've got um, M. Soter from Pints and Panels, which is a... Um, it was about time we got them on the podcast because they're, they're, the, they're the other comics and... Uh, beer folk <laughs> and, 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 and so so um yeah i'm really looking forward to having them on next week and uh yeah everyone thank you everyone who's joined us and thank you for everyone that's contributed like a colin jumped on you know colin's our uh, other one of our other hosts he jumps on just to yeah point out that you know he's literally just got on and heard uh, uh andrew talking about chunky sweaters again <laughs> uh, okay we'll see everybody next week and uh yeah Everyone have a lovely weekend and cheers. Yeah.